Fire Dancer is running on eight cores, I think, and like 16 gigs of RAM. So the hardware requirements that you see on Solana could be much, much lower. What that tells me is not that we should lower the hardware requirements, is that we should figure out if there's bugs in the labs client that we haven't fixed yet and double the capacity of the network. If we can quadruple the compute units per block right now and the network is fine, it's like free growth. Like, why wouldn't we do it? This episode is brought to you by Access Protocol. Access Protocol is the best way to get access to premium crypto content without the ads, without the annoying subscriptions that are impossible to cancel. It's crypto native. It's here today. Go check them out. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lightspeed. Today, we are joined by Anatoly. He is back on the pod. Anatoly, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, always pumped to have you on. I think we'd have you on every week. Uh, I know we have a lot to talk about. Mert actually messaged me and said he's going to hog this podcast. So if I don't say anything for the rest of the show, please understand. Um, but Anatoly, I do have one question I want to get in here before we go any further. And that's the Saga 2 or Chapter 2. And I want to yep. talk about that because it was an announcement that came out last week, um, but it wasn't long ago, probably just four weeks ago that you were on another podcast talking about how the saga wasn't really selling that well. Um, you're like, you know, it's been a great yeah. learning experience, but I don't know where this is going to go next. Uh, you, it wasn't selling like hotcakes. The next thing you know, Solana narrative kind of takes off. You have these airdrops, you have bonk, absolutely explode. And now you've sold out 20,000 units. I just want to know, like, what was that experience like? Like, what's been the most exciting for you? It was weird. Um <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the thesis is the same. We kind of have this belief that um, crypto is like new user, new kind of user generated content. It's digital content that you can transfer and own. Um, so it kind of inherits more rights from the creator because you can force a limited supply and transfer like rights and stuff like that into the contracts and, and make it kind of more interesting for creators. And that doesn't really work with the app stores, because their models are built around this idea that the developer owns all the content and the developer is price insensitive to how much the app store can kind of levy them. So like a user that's buying a movie through like iTunes or whatever, they don't care if uh, Apple gets, gets 30% of that revenue. Amazon doesn't really, I mean, they care that they don't get that revenue, but it doesn't increase the costs to them to add that extra user right like there's no additional cost to to enable users on ios versus android it's not like you're shipping physical hardware and all of a sudden apple's tax puts you below profitability for the cost of the physical device right for the apple or whatever you grew you put in the you, you can't like tax physical objects the same way so but with like user generated content if i own this like monkey mbs skeleton king and i listed for you know a hundred thousand dollars in Magic Eden. Magic Eden doesn't own it, so they can't eat the thirty percent cost and give it to to like Apple, right? They have to list it for thirty percent more in their iOS app if they have NFT sales enabled. <laughs> and the user is going to be like, "What the f? This thing is worth a hundred k. Why am I paying one hundred and thirty in iOS?" This is why, like, there is no like mobile native mar NFT marketplace. It just seems like. Why don't we have those, right? Like, that's why. <laughs> so there's this like kind of weird problem. And, you know, obviously these kind of weird problems usually are an opportunity. I don't know how big it is. I don't know what's the likelihood of us succeeding. But basically, developers that hate like that tax need some outlet. And there's an opportunity for us to get all the NFT and meme people into the same distribution channel. And those are the spendiest internet users in the world and mobile gaming is like a hundred billion a year industry apple takes 30 percent of it that's crazy right <laughs> for nothing <laughs> uh if there is a distribution channel with the exact same users that are generating most of your revenues because mobile gaming is just like also very power law heavy revenue stream five percent of the users generate like 90 percent of the revenue if all of a sudden those users are also nft traders you can deploy games to them in a mobile environment, get all the same features, get all that UX, get in-app purchases, all of that stuff, but without the 30% tax, that could be that tipping point. Uh, but it's hard to get there. We need to first like get a big enough set of people all in the same platform, all actively doing stuff. And like Solana Mobile is not like a content creator. We don't know how to make games. We don't know how to make <laughs> even NFTs. We tried to make NFTs. Those were kind of <laughs> mediocre. 
but uh, we know how to make hardware, we know how to make systems. So if we build this phone and we get ecosystem devs to go build experiences, airdrops, whatever, that could get the flywheel going. We'll see though. There's like a lot of ways it could fail. But yeah, it was a weird, weird moment for it to be kind of like on the in cockroach mode, like basically waiting and seeing to overselling out all our remaining inventory. And people wrote like bots that were submitting orders. This is like an NFT mint. They were just <laughs> like they hacked Shopify and would submit like orders no matter what price we set them to. Like we set the price to like a hundred thousand dollars a phone and they would still submit them. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh we have to cancel all of those and stuff. Like there was no way to like stop people from buying it after like we ran out, uh, because of the way that these like my God, man, the inventory systems of the world are like <laughs> the worst databases ever built. <laughs> so yeah, it was a really strange experience and that validated the theory a little bit. You're like, okay, there was an airdrop. It was built by an ecosystem dev. There was like a unique experience with the phone. People are getting it. Is the scalable? So then we did the pre-order and that sold out, that sold like 30,000 in 30 hours. And that's Pretty big, even for like a CES kind of like rip that rabbit thing that was super hot in CES sold ten thousand in one day. So you kind of get like you get signal, but it's still not clear whether we can build a ecosystem of users that are going to be mobile consumers. Like the the tipping point for me is going to be when like Epic ships a game for the the Saga App Store, even if it's not a crypto game. Like, I don't even care if it has any crypto features or not. Like, if Epic recognizes that this is a distribution channel for them and they ship a game to it, then I know that we, we kind of, we got there. What are some, because obviously you guys launched a saga before this. What are some tactics that you'll do differently this time? Like, what have you learned? What What's going to be different? Oh, man, like... um uh, I mean, like the price point, I think a lot of people balked at the thousand dollar device price point. So we really trying to get it down to 450. Um, by the way, these are not profitable <laughs> price points. <laughs> Hardware has like initialization costs. You have to do the R&D and the certification in like a bunch of different markets and you have to have a minimum order. And like those become profitable at like 250,000 plus. If you can sell that many units, you can eke out a profit, but the margins are like razor thin, like it sucks. And these big companies like, you know, Google, Samsung, Apple, they have all that stuff optimized away, right? Because of scale. So the initialization costs for them are pretty low. Plus they can literally take their app store fees and subsidize the device, right? Like if they, if they wanted to. Uh, but so it's hard for us to compete so we have to build a device basically for cost um, and try to build it as fast as we can so we can like capture like, you know, a, you know, a moment and get it out and then get ecosystem devs to be excited, ship stuff, and hopefully something catches fire. And if it does and people are like, what? I want like, why are these sold out? I want another device. That means then we maybe go do round three, right? But it's not, there's a bunch of ways all this stuff can fail. This is like a... I don't know why, why I'm doing this, <laughs> but like, <laughs> it's just like the, the fee is just too big. It's like 20, 30% is insane, right? Like we're talking about crypto disrupting banks and they charge bips. They charge hundredth of a percent, <laughs> right? Like, and that is a massive total addressable market, right? Like finance is like 20 trillion a year, but it's pretty efficient. Apple and Google charge 20 to 30%. It's insane <laughs> on digital content. So if crypto is a disruptor of digital value transfer, this seems like a really, like a huge opportunity. And then if that could be a driver to build a, you know, phone company, that's massive, right? Like if somehow we manage to like get to a million units sold or whatever per year, that's a home run. That's a, a really big technology company and like can drive massive change across the industry and, and do a bunch of stuff. Yeah, that's uh, very well put. I found it funny when people were commenting about the cash grab aspects and I was like, I don't think you guys have ever built hardware. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no chance. yeah. Anyone that can think they could 
make this a profitable enterprise, I'll hire you like right away. <laughs> Quick break to tell you about Access Protocol, the easiest and best way to stay up to date on what's happening in crypto by following your favorite publishers. And you can do all of it without a subscription, without having to worry about ads. And we all know subscriptions. How many do you have? 10, 20? Can you cancel it? It's all a mess. Well, Access Protocol solves this and they do it in a crypto native way. They have over 60 publishers that include CoinGecko, The Block, Crypto Slate, and a whole long list of independent creators. So how it works is you find your favorite publishers and you stake the ACS token, that's the access token. And once you stake, you have access to all that creator's content without the hassle of ads or subscriptions that you can't cancel and you don't know how many you have. Access Protocol already has over 225,000 users that are finding new creators, that are reading content, and even receiving NFTs from these creators. Because one of the cool things with Access Protocol is that these publishers, they can know who their subscribers are. They can make it where, okay, maybe we'll do an in-person an event or maybe we'll do an nft drop and we'll do it only to our most loyal stakers aka readers in early 2024 they're even releasing v2 it's crypto native it's on solana and it's an awesome product but a link in the show notes to the hub uh it's the easiest way to get started so go check them out today quick break to tell you about an upcoming event i promise you don't want to miss it's blockworks biggest and best institutional conference called das london it's a two-day event happening in london this march where we're going to have over 700 institutions 130 speakers and a couple thousand of us all under one roof crypto is in a position for the first time to actually on board these institutions and they're showing up. We have companies from BlackRock to Visa launching real products in the space. We have the real world asset narrative taking off. We have things like payments that have been exponentially growing. And then we have things like deep end happening in the Solana ecosystem. There's a ton of capital right now in this institutional space. It's going to be coming on chain. It's going to completely change the industry. Whether you are an institution or you're a retail user or you just want to learn more about what's going on in the space, this conference is for you. You're going to be able to meet some of the best and smartest people in the space. The speaker lineup is absolutely incredible and you'll get to hang out with me. But the best part is you actually get 10% off your ticket if you use Lightspeed 10 when checking out. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, I recommend buying this today because one, you'll forget about it. Two, these ticket prices go up every single month. So anyways, I hope to see you there. Now, let's get back to the show. Okay, so that's the phone. Now what I want to talk about is a year and a half to two years ago, we would talk a lot about what are the upcoming changes to the network to, to make it better. I think now it's in a much better place, right? Um, during heavy, heavy spam um, or congestion events, the chain holds up. Um, obviously, it can be better. And now that's what we're working on. So I guess first I want to start with um, assessing the current state of the chain, right? So currently there's some, uh, you know, uh, implementation details, not particularly robust, let's say on the scheduler. Um, there's some jitter on the network. Um, some sends don't get um, finalized because maybe they're public connections and not staked. Um, there's a lot of random things like that. So can you maybe just, what's on your mind about, the current state of the network and what are some of the biggest problems present right now? Yeah, there's like um, a bunch of stuff that happens in like that lifetime of a transaction before it hits a block producer. And the way that this is, sol this is solved in like other networks is using a mempool. And generally what a mempool is, is that you submit your transactions or gossip to a bunch of nodes and they simulate them and evaluate them for value like how much is this thing worth and then when i ask other nodes hey give me your most valuable transactions i get kind of the top of the heap and it kind of spreads around in a very it's very robust very censorship resistant because if you can get a high paying transaction to one node that has like six or seven peers all of a sudden it's it gets to the top of the heap across the entire network and the next block producer, no matter who they are, even if they're like randomly selected through proof of work, sees it and includes them in the block. And that that's a very robust kind of censorship resistant guarantee, but it's very slow. Um, and that slowness means that it takes a while for transactions to propagate. And even if you increase TPS and block times and all this stuff, that extra lag is really, really felt by the users. And it also creates an environment where you're pricing access to the block in a one dimensional way to where if you have a liquidation and like some other event all happening at the same time, they all want to get to the top of the block because they want to be in the next block. So as this information is propagating, I want to be first. Whoever is asking for give me your best transactions, I want this liquidation. I want to make sure that they include me. Right. And that that forces that like competition for the top of the heap. And that creates kind of a single priority queue for for everything and, and really causes gas fees to spike and stuff like that. So we tried to innovate there. 
And the way that Solana works is that you can actually submit transactions directly to the leader. And if not the leader, to a stake node, or you can partner with a stake node or something like that, then the leader gets kind of a funnel from the world. And this funnel is pretty big. Like during a NFT mint, people will submit like a million packets per second because <laughs> they are really, really trying to be first. And this is the, that, the fact that people try to submit more packets per second to be first in a block, that's the bug. Like it, for if, if you have to understand, like that, that's the inefficiency of our design. And this is kind of what we're fighting. The mempool folks are fighting uh, speed and this like uh, gas war <laughs> for, for being top of the queue. And we have a different problem. There's no like, there's no perfect solution. Otherwise it'd be out already, right? Like, so you like kind of pick your battles. So because we really care about latency and we have this multi-dimensionality to how we want fees to be priced, we have this different system. So with QoS, the leader actually caps the amount of traffic they receive. And I think right now it's at about 100,000 packets per second, which seems crazy, right? Like, why do you need to receive 100,000 transactions per second if you only see, like, I'm looking at Solana FM right now, it's like 800 actual user transactions land. Like, why do you need to see 100,000? <laughs> uh, well, because we want to avoid this kind of top of the queue problem. So the way that Solana runtime works is if you include transactions in a block, they all take a write lock to an account. And it's just like in a database, it's a write lock on memory. And you can only have so much compute that's write locking a specific location because that limits single-threaded speed. So you can only like have a block last 400 milliseconds. So we can roughly estimate how much compute can, can lock any particular account. So when that happens, the, for the, the write lock that gets saturated, you can no longer add any, any more transactions to the block, but you can inc include others. So why you need to see a hundred thousand transactions at the same time is because you're trying to grab as many buckets of high priority transactions as you can. So not just one. Uh, so every stake node that is receiving public transactions is sorting them by these account buckets and then is forwarding the top transactions from every bucket to the to the leader. And then the leader is receiving this like kind of mixture of a bunch of different stuff from every stake node and then also merging it into buckets. So that kind of like merge sort to me it like reminds me of merge sort if you ever remember that algorithm in, in computer science. Right, like you're doing this merge sort operation at the leader, so you need to see a very wide kind of like snapshot of what everyone believes are the highest paying accounts for different resources on the on the network. Um, so that's that's how it works, and the challenge there is that like if you have to process a hundred thousand transactions, you have to check for duplicates. You got to check that they're valid. You got to do signature verification. You got to check that they can pay the fee, and all this kind of creates delays. So even if you have like a super highly prioritized transaction, you, you're you're willing to pay the to be first in the block for the scheduler to figure out that you should be first in the block. That transaction has to go to the leader through this pipeline, then to the scheduler, then to the top of the queue. And if that delay is so long that the block is over. You just don't get prioritized. You get put in the next block. And th this is why you see, like, even without some of the idiosyncrasies from the way that the scheduler works because it, it's multi threaded, this is why you see, like, kind of this like weird behavior where I'm paying a high priority fee, but I see other transactions that have paid a lower fee ahead of me in the block or maybe in the previous block. Um, so making that pipeline like as tight and as fast as possible is like a lot of implementation work and i think what needs to happen and this is kind of like the big discussion on in the simd forums is that you actually need to put some economic back pressure on saturated accounts and this is like you can think of it as 1559 but for write locks so not for a block but for, for a single account that's receiving a whole pile of transactions if that thing is constantly being saturated start increasing the, the write lock fee and at some point, the fee is going to be so high that users are just not willing to pay that fee to sign it. Um, 
And that means that you now have fewer transactions in that pipeline. When you have, when you're dealing with 10,000 packets per second, it's much faster to sort and prioritize them than when you're dealing with 100,000 packets per second. So prioritization is going to be more effective, stuff like that. So that was quite a bit. So it seems like, uh, I mean, if I were to just sum this up for maybe non-technical people, uh, basically on other blockchains, there's a mempool, which means there's block building is kind of discrete. Whereas on Solana, it's kind of continuous in a sense. Um, and that causes problems because people have direct access to the leader and you need to figure out how to control that access, but in an economical way such that they still get maximized some sort of economic value and they don't just get spammed, which is what used to happen and cause some problems uh, back in the day. Um, what do you, okay, so I have like three questions as, as follow-ups here. Um, first, um, what do you think about how Jito approaches this? Because uh, they obviously make this uh, process discreet. Um, they've seen a lot of success with it based on the numbers I've seen. So what, what are your like high-level thoughts on that? Yeah, it's funny. They built a mempool on a system that was built without. <laughs> and it'd be cool for it to generalize to user transactions. And I hope they try to do that too. And if we can see an improvement there, that'd be awesome. But they're, they're particularly optimized for creating bundles and searchers of, of like for DeFi. Um, like I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of what they're doing. And I, I think it's like really important that, that they like continue working on the, on the math problem because it's, I think kind of like both the feature and the bug of all of these systems is Mav. I think it's like <laughs> probably the most important feature is that they can capture value from Mav and probably the most glaring bug that, that that's possible. So we'll see how it like all plays out. Um, the question uh, I have is that like, can it scale to a large enough throughput to where like we can handle it at high TPS? If it only works for like, searchers to submit infrequent bundles, right? Like to to snipe those things. Like and you're talking like tens of bundles per second, but not fifty thousand TPS, then it will serve its purpose, right? Like because I think the traffic from that activity is going to be pretty low but super high value. But we need a system for payments, for gaming, for everything else. So probably the hybrid approach is the way to go. I think what's funny is that like flashbots on Ethereum looks more like Gulfstream, which is Solana's like transaction forwarding system. And yeah, Gito on Solana looks more like the mempool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and then my second question is, with regards to the scheduler, um, there are a few changes and we basically never cover this uh, as an ecosystem in Solana, but I want to talk quickly about, so 1.17 is basically, uh, I think most people are, at least half are running it now. Um, and then 1.18 is coming out. Can you briefly talk about the changes in 17 and 18 that people should care about? Yeah, so the big pain in the like in our side with the scheduler is that uh, block producers right now, they execute the transactions as well as schedule them. So kind of trying to do this like optimization where if I'm a block producer and I like schedule the block, I also execute it so I can vote on it right away. Um, all in one machine. Um, the problem with that is that you want multi-threaded execution during block build to, for that later stage, but scheduling, you actually really want single thread to go find all the high priority transactions and pack them exactly in that order. Um, <laughs> but, but we have four threads that do this execution because of this like kind of like original coupling. So until like that, that, we have what we we were calling bankless leaders until we have full separation for of, of block producers from actual like execution. Um, you're going to have this weird thing where you have four threads trying to pack the blocks. And that means that the order is going to have some jitter simply because of the multi-threaded nature of, of like execution there. Um, so Andrew's done a bunch of work to reduce that and, and make that jitter a lot less kind of, uh, I guess the worst case has to be a, a lot, a lot less uh, bad. One, one quick follow up on that is bankless leaders. Is that the same thing as PBS proposer builder separation? Or what's the difference there? I don't know enough about the latest design in PBS. I think 
Probably not. I think like a lot of what the PBS stuff involves with is the economics around being selected as a block producer, like posting a burn to or, or something like that. I think this is just Solana moving t- towards a more asynchronous model for execution, really separating the the work of executing things from ordering and consensus and finality. And so my third question is, um, so you just mentioned the economic back pressure stuff, which is uh, you guys with Tao wrote a SIMD on it. Um, it was well received by some people, maybe not so well received by other people. Um, so I'm curious, um, what do you think of the feedback so far? Um, and I'm also curious on, um, after that, um, what you think about dynamic base fees? So that's the same thing, like, right? Like the right lock fees are basically dynamic base fees. What, why do you make them dynamic on? Uh, and like the right answer is load, right? So if the load is high, you increase the fee. If the load is low, you decrease them. And this is an attempt to do that, just not at block level. And why it's important to try the right lock fees first is because if you start increasing global fees, that'll work. Eventually, people will stop sending, signing transactions and load will drop. Uh, but then you're indiscriminately punishing all the users. Uh, right lock fees are very, very targeted to the saturated use case. And um, that one, I think, would work better without creating high fees for all the users. I think you, sh- you should see the base fee go up effectively in isolation for a specific set of accounts that are that are like the source of like you know 99% of the the load across all the all the stages. Um, it's the reason why like you need this economic back pressure and this I used to be in the camp where like no we can just optimize the software to where you don't need it is because the hardware that the network is deployed on is just really different. It's heterogeneous. There's a bunch of different operators, different systems. AWS has like the worst hardware sometimes. <laughs> and like a lot of people need to use the network with different needs and like requirements. Like Coinbase uses AWS and AWS sucks. But <laughs> it would be really shitty if Solana was so like required s- such high end hardware that was so unique that Coinbase could not run it in AWS, right? That would be, I think, bad for the network if the number of places where salon validators could be deployed was very, very small. Not even if the cost is high, but it's just like operationally, like people expect that I have code, I can run it on AWS or Azure or GCE, and they have different hardware constraints, even if it's absurdly like 10 times more expensive than TerraSwitch or Latitude. Like you still need to support those deployments. So like you have a wide range of hardware um, and a block like compute limits are a very crude estimate because they measure like bandwidth, like limits and memory and uh, cache misses and a whole bunch of stuff. And we try to all stuff it into this one single number. Um, If we didn't, it'd just be like really, really tough to like put any limits on execution at all because like (laughs) again all all of these all of these systems are going to have different benchmarks and sometimes pretty wide-ranging benchmarks so if you over provision them you like say okay we we limit everything to a single core like ethereum you get that you have a very slow system that can run reliably across a wide range of hardware but is but you basically like have limited the amount of resources it can use to such a small amount that it's guaranteed to be a- available everywhere. That sucks, right? <laughs> and even they like don't want to do that, so they have economic back pressure. So like that that's kind of like the goal of it is that we want to be able to set the limits for throughput pretty high to where the network can sustainably run it and effectively have like burst capacity, but if somebody's constantly using it at the red line, you got to start forcing them to back off uh, to like kind of the baseline. And that, that to me is kind of like the right approach, right? Like if you allow, you have slack capacity to where if you have a burst of activity for five minutes, the price isn't going to change much. But if you are like for hours on end, it's running at, <laughs> at the limit, the price should start increasing to the point where 
people back off, right? That that's kind of like how these systems are like best designed in my in my opinion. Mm-hmm. On a kind of a related note, I have two follow ups to that. So um, Jeff from Jump today uh, actually, when I said like, what should I ask Tolly? He said something related, which is what steps are being taken towards slashing poorly performing validators. Are there in-progress features or SIMDs to address this? I'm tired of potato validator operators causing stress to the network without penalties, caps, when slashing. Um, well, slashing for performance is really, really hard. That basically needs to be the people that are staking with those validators need to move their stake. They need to care that they're like hurting the network. The cost of moving stake is very negligible. So I think what we need to do is identify the validators that are bad, get them to move, get the stake to move. I think a lot of those are unfortunately like foundation validators from the delegation program and they're already taking steps to start like kicking the potatoes off. (laughs) (laughs) Garrett, did you have something? Yeah, I've got a question that that we like touched on. But Anatoly, I know one of the main goals here is you don't want to price out certain use cases, right? Like you don't want yep. DeFi to price out payments. Because as a developer, I'm thinking like where to launch. Go to Solana, but then you're like, okay, well, if all this activity goes there, maybe it's going to you know push up these base fees where my payments don't actually make sense there. So can you talk about like there's local fee markets? Which- yep. Yeah, yeah. So, so because of how Solana runtime works, developers go through this painful process of figuring out when they create a transaction, which accounts are writable and which are readable. And that actually allows us to create localized fee markets because there's a limit to how many writes you can do per account. When that limit is saturated, you go to the next account. So prioritization should pick the highest priority paying transactions to first into that writable account. So if you have a a use case that doesn't touch any of the hot DeFi markets, you don't care how hot those markets get because the fees there are not going to touch like your game or your payments use case, unless the entire block is saturated. And if the block is saturated, this is when we need the validators to basically double the capacity of the number of parallel things they can do. Like the number of hotspots that the network can handle should double every two years because Moore's Law is on our side. And this is great. Like we want as many hotspots to all concurrently occur at Solana. <laughs> uh, so the, the question is like, with the with the exponential write lock fees, what it's trying to address are the externalities outside of just priority fee pricing that are occurring from these hotspots. And this is because we don't have a mempool because we want this really fast environment for transactions to submit. Folks that are spamming the hot accounts are saturating those other pipelines. They're submitting you know ninety thousand transactions, ninety nine percent of which get dropped because that account gets saturated. So we need to increase the fee to access that account to the point where they don't sign and submit, right? And all of a sudden, that externality goes away, right? Like you're not negatively impacting a game that's also trying to submit a transaction into the scheduler. Um, Amongst with like, that's one problem. The other problem is just having replay constantly be hit with like highly saturated accounts kind of creates a sequential dependency of single threaded execution, which sucks. <laughs> so increasing the fees there will break it up too. Um, so stuff like that, I think is like all important fixes that we can do in the runtime to really make the system more robust to burst activity and wide range of activity without creating like negative externalities that hurt other use cases. Okay. I want to knock you out like three or four more very high level and completely unrelated topics. Uh, so, so get ready. Um, first, I want to start with consensus. Um, this has been, um, I mean, I get reply guide about this all the time. Hey, how come Solana doesn't have this formal document outlining how consensus works in all cases mathematically? And then basically, I think your response is something like, well, does Linux have this? Um, or, or something along those lines. So can you maybe um, think about or can yeah. you talk about how you think about this and how we should think about it. I mean, it'd be awesome if anyone's a, like a researcher at a university and wants to do this kind of research. It's probably the best place to do it because uh, a bunch of engineers are going to be the ones that do stuff that's unexpected for academics, <laughs> anyways. So, like, yeah, go go do research in Solana Consensus, find a bug and submit it, and we'll fix it. Um, the basically, like, I think culturally. 
uh, the engineering team from Solana was like 15 to 20 years out of college. So we just like don't even know how to write those papers anymore. Uh, we know how to build those systems, but like, it's just not like I li in my career, I've had <laughs> one event where I had to rip out a formally verified kernel and put in like a custom system because of performance. Like, it's just not something that often comes up in commercial like implementations. Is this thing formally verified? No, like CTO at a big tech company has really cared about that. So it's not a, it's a thing that is important for a group of developers that are trying to build something from scratch and they need to understand the parameters and kind of get going. But it starts losing its effectiveness once you, you're live, right? And you know the parameters of the system, you know how it responds to like actual events and stuff. Um, so that, there's like just differences there. Um, and from my perspective, like I'd be happy for that to be like, for a team of researchers to go formally verify that. I think the foundation is like looking for folks to give grants to, to do that. But like, we're not like all the code is open source. You can go validate it. You can run attack vectors. We stress test it. There's a bounty for liveness. There's a bounty for safety. We go through every permutation of attack vectors we can think of. And I don't even know if like other protocols do this, but at the end of the day, the white paper isn't going to save you. It's the work that you do, like to validate your assumptions and make sure that like nothing goes wrong. That's what's going to save you. We do that, like to 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 the hilt. Like, uh, and if that's something that you want to work on, we have, you know, like the folks at labs are hiring for that as well. I want to now move to clients, um, and obviously, before we touch on Fire Dancer. I want to ask your thoughts on the recent uh, events on Ethereum and kind of how there was a bug in, in one of the clients and how that um, sparked some discussions around inactivity leaks and liveness over safety, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So what are your high level thoughts there? Yeah, so like um, the hardest part uh, to kind of like validate, I would say, is liveness, not, not safety. Um, so... You can think of it from the perspective that these systems are designed with the assumption that the network actually goes rogue. Like Circle, when they deploy a node on Solana, they have dollars that will automatically wire out if you send them like a transaction, right? So they have, they have literal money on the line, right? And they don't trust the rest of the network. They don't care like what the economic security of the network is because they have no clue if that's real or not. It's just a number in a computer. They have, no, they have no idea who controls these other systems. So they don't trust. The only thing that they trust is their own node. When it processes an event, they have their own ledger. And that's the source of truth. And if that source of truth becomes inconsistent with the rest of the network, they halt. They don't process any more transactions. Everything basically stops. So from a perspective of like an operator like Circle, they internally do the work with a single node to have strong safety guarantees for the state that they care about. Does that make sense? And usually that's what it means to run a full node. So everyone that's participating in the network, you only trust your own full node, you assume the rest of the network is corrupt. And it keeps going as, by a miracle, right? <laughs> like if I don't trust anyone else, how does it keep making blocks? Uh, well, <laughs> what... Uh, consensus provides are like liveness guarantees that if there are forks or partitions or and stuff like that, that all the nodes that are participating in the protocol can resolve those and make the same choice consistently as they receive information out of order and messages out of order and continue and move forward. And while they're doing that, they're not accepting any new confirmations. They're just kind of accepting information and then they see that the rest of the network also said they're moving forward and then they move forward. And this is kind of that process how it works. And if you have bugs in a, a single client, you could get stuck. Messages could get dropped that shouldn't have been dropped. They could arrive out of order and put the state machine in a weird spot. And if you have, in theory, four clients, the probability of all of them having the same bug is pretty low. And if they're evenly distributed by stake, each one is 25%, and one of the clients gets stuck, the other 75 continue going because typically the threshold for moving forward is 66% or two thirds, right? So the network, like the network is safe 
from the soundness of I own my own node and I can run it and I can guarantee the state that it that it creates. And it's live from the soundness, like if I communicate with all these other machines, I can move forward. And that moving forward consistently is what is what like creates that liveness. So if you have multiple clients, you have you have improvements there. Um, but there's also risk simply because four teams spec, right? A single spec four teams is gonna be four different interpretations. <laughs> so so it's very likely that there are bugs that are inconsistencies that could be triggered that causes one of the clients to lose. And uh, in Ethereum, unfortunately, I think people trust Geth so much, and there's a penalty for being uh, having a client that's not working that they don't want to evenly distribute the stakes. You end up with a situation where you have like eighty percent of the eighty five percent of the stake, right, or something like that, is is using a single client. So you lose that that benefit of if there's like an actual implementation bug that impacts state that the network would halt. Um, mm-hmm. So this is kind of like the the trade-offs that you make, I think, with liveless leaks and things like that. I don't think Solana would ever have a liveless leak. In activity. My pers- yeah, in activity leak, yep. And I, um, so right before I get to fire answer, maybe on kind of a related topic, although not directly, um, are, the, are the concept of vote transactions, right? Um, and, a very common misconception is okay. Solana has vote transactions to artificially inflate TPS. Can you just give, give me a sound bite and tackle that? <laughs> Solana's runtime is so fast that it can handle consensus messages as transactions. That's <laughs> like it's the opposite. The whole point, like, uh, like there was this huge uh, belief that you could not scale a layer one like with traditional all-to-all BFT implementation beyond like 100 nodes. Like Tendermint was the limit. And it did, that statement did not make any sense because if you can scale the runtime to have 50,000 TPS, no one questioned that. Why can't some of those transactions be votes for 25,000 systems? <laughs> right? Like it, it obviously like it should... It should have been just a very, very simple. It's like a contradiction to say that you can't scale the network to a hundred beyond a hundred nodes, but you can scale the TPS to fifty thousand nodes, unless you're optimizing the wrong thing, right? So, like for my for my point of view, like the fact that we can quickly replicate very large number of throughput is not limited by node count. That's kind of what Solana proved. So it doesn't matter how big the network gets. And if every node node votes, it's just a transaction. Who cares, right? Like, who cares if they're submitting one transaction per block? Because the whole point is of scaling to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of TPS. That nodes voting is an insignificant load in the network. So this is kind of like the, the <laughs> it's a it's a dumb thing to argue about because the systems that can't do this are the bro- poorly designed ones that somehow scale TPS without the ability to actually utilize it for like consensus or for anything else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, the, the node count thing is interesting because like some people will look at these newer L- L1s and be like, oh, they're like as fast as Solana. And it's like, okay, well, they have like 39 validators. Okay. Yeah. So, so run Solana with 39 nodes like Pith does, and you can see it's much, much faster. <laughs> you can set block times to 200 milliseconds in that environment. And Tully, is it fair to say as well that all these new chains are going to have these scheduler issues that Solana is going through? They just don't have that activity. Well, it depends if they try to manage like multiple resource pricing. So, like, if you actually want localized fee markets, you're going to run into this because it's like a knapsack problem. It's like a multi-dimensional like packing problem. It's there's no like good solution for them. There's only like heuristics. Yeah. Um, and then, so on the topic of node count, actually, let's talk about your end game block. I don't want to say block post Google doc, um, with, uh, and, and it says, uh, you know, the ideal end state is something like 200 milliseconds with over 10,000 nodes, 10,000 is kind of arbitrary. I think you said like you want some Midwestern bank manager to just feel comfortable arbitrarily. Um, what is that end game about? Why do you want that? Well, Bitcoin has like about 
12,000 nodes and it hit like multi-trillion valuation. So to me, that shows that like that node count is sufficient to handle very large value, very large amount of value, right? Like, um, I don't think Bitcoin would have hit that valuation if it had like 39 nodes. <laughs> right? Like it's just, yeah, not as a, not as a permissionless cryptocurrency, maybe as like a bank that is running in permission mode or something like that. That could be interesting, but like, yeah, as an open permissionless cryptocurrency, I think it has to kind of get over that 10,000 number. Um, and, and so, um, can you talk a bit more about that end game? Like you, you, you imagine this world with 200 millisecond block times, obviously the, maybe the qualitative statement that you go with is sinking information globally. Yeah. Yeah. So like the, the big pain in the butt for us is that these are different systems. We don't own them. Some are in AWS, some are in like bare metal servers and Terra switch. Um, and they have variable execution time. So shrinking the block time from, you know, 400 milliseconds to like 120 would be my goal is hard because the f execution has to happen at the same time as, as block propagation. So all this stuff is happening right now, all synchronously as the block is propagated, is executed and nodes vote as, as fast as possible. And the variability in execution time prevents us from shrinking block times. Um, so what I, what I want is a synchronous execution, like really the quorum can be doesn't even need to know anything about the state. The only thing that it cares about is who is in the quorum and what's the next quorum. And that could be like, anybody can post that over gossip and say, look, we, everyone, all the full notes did all the execution of all the stake weight changes and all the LSDs and whatever. <laughs> and these are, this is the next quorum. And if nobody challenges that for like an epoch, then that's what happens. Like you don't actually need the consensus nodes or the block producers to execute any other state. And it's kind of a weird thing to think about. It means that the network is kind of running blind, but Circle is not. They have a full node. They're fully executing all the transactions and they observe that the quorum is synchronized with their full node. And if it ever becomes desynchronized, they just, they halt, right? Their money's safe in the bank. Their state is safe because they run a full node. They don't care if the rest of the network is corrupted. This is kind of like, I think, the, the cool thing to think about is that security of the network doesn't come from the network itself. It's coming from every individual node running a super a, a secure system that they can verify as a good connection and is full processing all the transactions. So like, that's cool, right? It means every individual person can fully secure their own setup. They don't depend on anyone else. And this communication protocol just kind of keeps them all in sync as, you know, if not for the grace of God, just keeps running. <laughs> so with that um, grounding, right, which is like what matters for security is kind of the nodes, the full nodes. Then there's people who will say, well, what about economic security? Um, what are you going to do? If, like the basically price talks. And then, you know, you um, generally tend to think or say at least uh, that economic security is kind of a meme. Um, you know, I mean, like probably the worst you can do is some temporary liveness failure at a very high cost. What are your yep. overall thoughts on that? Yeah, this is like, I think, um, economic security is a hangover from like proof of work. Like I think people look at proof of work and the cost to create a uh, heaviest fork. And that does make sense in Bitcoin, but even there, all the operators would reject a rollback deeper than six blocks at this point. Like Binance, Coinbase, 100% would. And their systems would halt and they would be like trying to figure out what the F is happening. <laughs> so, so that would be localized liveness failures that are up to the operator, right? And they would stop confirmations from Bitcoin if they saw a fork that caused a six, six blocks rollback because their assumption is that within six blocks, this is final. Um, so yeah, you can say that academically, Bitcoin didn't halt at that moment, but everyone that relies on it as a communications protocol stopped accepting messages from it as final. <laughs> that is equivalent to a halt from like any kind of operational point of view. Um, and similarly on Solana Circle, right? When they run their full node, 
hopefully when Fire Dancer's out, they'll actually run both Fire Dancer and Labs Client. If they ever disagree, they halt. Um, they could also run many different nodes, like M of them, which is going to guarantee that if the quorum is ever taken over, like completely hostile, and tries to partition the network and create two confirmations of two different forks, if Circle runs 10 different nodes anonymously, the quorum doesn't know which ones are in which partition. And the more nodes Circle runs and has guarantees and communication, right? So the, its nodes are, it has control or and can, can guarantee that they're not partitioned. The harder it is for an attacking quorum to create that double-headed signed fork, right? As soon as both headers are detected, everyone halts, all the, all the honest nodes halt because they see that there's now two confirmed blocks with more than two thirds. That's an invalid state. All the honest operators that are have a path between them, right? A minimum spanning tree between them, see both of those headers, they halt. Effectively, same thing as a as a long range attack. And the quorum can keep trying to create these two blocks, but they don't matter anymore because effectively everyone that matters halted the network. It's just the the malicious quorum is still running. And those nodes that halted could actually restart from the last point that they've all confirmed and they have all the signatures to to validate that and create a new quorum slash the old one so they can't just like get stake back and try this attack again and continue. And there would be a, a thing, right? There'd be people on Discord, somebody would say Solana's attacked and crypto Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> but like actually it would be what is supposed to happen, right? Like I want all the high-end operators to run multiple machines I want all of them to have guarantees that their machines are well connected. That means that they should never partition. That means they halt if they ever detect multiple headers, stuff like this. And that means that security of any given setup is in the hands of each individual operator. And that's a really, really strong security assumption. It means it's only up to me to secure my own setup. I don't care about anyone else. There's no like majority control, right? Like that there's no there's no honest majority dependency whatsoever. Um, and that's a very, very scalable system that is really important because I think these systems have to be kind of like convincing risk-wise to every individual operator, like individually. Like that Midwestern bank, if we wanted to become a fully on-chain bank, their CTO has to be like, okay, if I run these boxes and the setup and we keep it secure, we're safe. And I can tell them, yes, like your system will halt as soon as it detects an anomaly and you will not accept any invalid confirmations and you're not going to wire out any dollars that belong to your to your clients and they can be like okay i get it right <laughs> that that those security guarantees are, are what's necessary for finance probably not necessary for gaming and loot boxes but like <laughs> but i believe like crypto's ambitions are much much harder and this is why like it doesn't depend how much stake is there, what the value of it is on Binance, like all that stuff is irrelevant. What matters is the setup, the operational like security of that particular instance. So that, um, I'm just never going to get fired answer at this point, but that also uh, brings up uh, maybe something else related, which is to say that, so you're basically saying like there's clearly uh, an incentive for these people or the companies to run nodes for just uh, their business security pr purposes. And so, which then, you know, you probably know what the next question is going to be. There's a lot of criticism about validator profitability um, on Solana and, and inflation and whatnot. Can you just give your high level thoughts on that and what you think people get wrong about that um, approach? Yeah, I mean, like, I think the biggest criticism is that, like, Solana inflation is too high and that somehow that's a cost to the network. Uh, mathematically, like, if you look at the network, um, inflation is moving value between unstaked users and staked users and that is a cost to unstaked users but you can't like <laughs> if, if everyone is equally staked like i think the staking percentage are now 70 percent if everyone is exactly 70 percent staked and 70 percent unstaked no individual person is being diluted because it's literally just moving from one bucket to the other one that they own so it's not a cost unless you know the exact distribution and who the users are. Um, so you can say it's a cost to those specific users, but it's a gain to the other users. And kind of the open market kind of evens that out. But the network itself has a cost. It's the hardware and the operational overhead to run all the systems. 
And ideally, that cost is borne by businesses that have like some random reason to run it. Like Circle, they issued dollars on, on Solana, they run their setup. They don't care about validator profitability because they have a business on top of that that is so profitable that the cost of the setup is irrelevant. Similarly to Tensor, to Magic Eden, whatever, right? Like, I don't know how many RPC nodes you guys run, uh, <laughs> but like you have a business that makes money off of Solana state that has nothing to do with validator profitability. And that's great. And any one of those nodes can provide the security necessary to detect a double spend or an invalid state transition by a fully corrupted quorum, and we can halt and restart the network. So security comes from that. The costs are borne by the machines and the operational overhead, and the gains to the network from a black box perspective is anytime somebody pays for block inclusion, that is money going into the network. Because if I have some stake and somebody literally gives me like potatoes uh, as a side <laughs> bribe, right? They like bring me potatoes to get their transactions into, into a block. I can take those potatoes, sell them, get more stake, and now earn more potatoes because now I have more block space. <laughs> it doesn't matter how those fees arrive to the validator whether they're priority fees, whether it's MEV, whether it's like literally my neighbor giving me a sack of potatoes for a transaction, makes no difference. Those are all real world inputs that are driving like value creation. And if you just look at priority fees alone, um, I think it's like run rate right now is like 100 mil a year, which is five times more than the cost of the physical hardware. So from a network perspective, like if you took the cost of the boxes and the priority fees just from that alone, it's already making more money than the cost of the boxes. So like that, in that sense, it's sustainable. Um, inflation is a nice way to like dampen that because validators do get paid from inflation and priority fees, if they become high enough, validators will start rebating their stakers to grow more stake. So kind of like the bucket of earnings for a validator, whether it's coming from priority fees or inflation is the same way, they will go and try to get more stake to earn more profit. Like, what again, doesn't matter if it's priority fees, if it's inflation, where the profit comes from, or potatoes, <laughs> right? Like they're incentivized to get more stake at whatever costs, and that could be through rebates or whatever. Um, so that kind of like becomes a wash, but having inflation, I think, dampens the ups and downs of bull and bust cycles. So yeah, I think last year at its lowest point, I think all the fees included were not adding up to the cost of the hardware is about half. So you have to say that like the network as a whole is running and potentially running in the negative. You don't know what other incentive mechanisms like, you know, potatoes or MEV were, were having a, an effect, but just from priority fees, those were not covering the cost of the hardware. Um, but in that moment, inflation is subsidizing that. Now it's the opposite, right? Like now, now priority fees are so high that um, it's more than enough. So like from a sustainability perspective, you have to look, from my belief is you look at holistically, what are all the work inputs, external work inputs going into the black box? And what are all the external costs that the black box is, is uh, paying for? Okay. Um guarantee there's a potato coin after this uh episode um <laughs> i've got one question this is a um, tip to validators <laughs> and it's only i want to know what you think the value is of like diet and like clients and all this because celestia and data availability layers is kind of taking off and i know you said das data availability sampling is going to be a feature eventually probably on every chain that they should have so yeah, how do you think about diet clients and let's just say you're an sbm roll up in that future is there a reason for that roll up for example to put their DA on Solana versus something like Celestia. Just how do, how do you think about that? <laughs> so I think all execution environments are competing because I think the only way that these systems make money is through like selling block space and that's an ex execution thing. Like if you're selling data, you're selling a commodity resource and the pricing and that data is going to approach the cost of the hardware. The reason why these systems could be like economically lucrative is because you're not selling data anymore. You're, you're not selling bandwidth or like a resource, you're selling specific content. People care about block inclusion because there's a specific NFT mint or market 
that has an economic value for me to access. And I'm willing to give you potatoes to be first, <laughs> right? <laughs> and if you move that like hotspot, right, to another layer, all the value that's captured from that content and is moved to the other layer. And now you're just selling data and bandwidth. It's a very kind of like commoditized thing. I can't imagine it being worth more than like two, three X the bandwidth because from a application layer that is like generating all the value, why wouldn't they just like find the cheapest one? And you can say that, oh, security is different, but marketing is not <laughs> and so you end up with a situation where like a layer two on ethereum will like without you know blinking will say we're using celestia data availability or eigen layer or whatever and you're like that's not the same security as ethereum it's not a layer two and it's only like me and dunkrat or whatever some poor ethereum researcher that cares about this <laughs> But if it's still marketed as a layer two, it's a layer two. And then it, it doesn't matter what DA layer it uses. Um, so my, my view is that like the big opportunity is like having a single giant execution layer that can handle as many concurrent hotspots as possible. Um, it doesn't matter if it's, if the validators, if it's write lock fees that are getting burned or it's priority fees that the validators are getting or like a MEV side tip. None of that matters as long as it's external input that's going into the network and you maximize that external input by having as many hotspots because those are content dependent. Um, they're not data or it's not a resource anymore. Um, so to me, like, I think people can build layer twos. They probably will. I don't think they're going to be any cheaper. Um, you can't solve the hotspot problem with layer twos, right? Like, database hotspot, the only solution is isolation and Solana already does that. So I don't think you'll see like a improvement. There are some places where you can get an improvement and I think it's like, um, but you don't need like a full layer two there. Like you can actually do something like zero X where you had a, a mempool with transactions that could be matched. Um, so you can run like a, like a very ephemeral order book that has super fast matching in a single system and only the matches get submitted to the network. Stuff like this, still, this is moving the execution of like prioritization into that layer above, right? It's it's no longer happening on, on the native layer. Uh, so value capture, most of it is gonna happen in that environment where that box is running. Um, could, uh, I think like could benefit users, but you, use, you lose composability. You can't like have Jupyter route atomically into that asynchronous box, which may or may not execute at the same time as other transactions. And this is, I think, the big advantage of, of trying to put it all in, in one system. Um, so you have composability, which creates network effects, which creates usage and liquidity and all this stuff aggregates. You can move move stuff out and you'll lose some of that. And you may gain, you know, your own, you may capture more of your own value, but you lose like the, the composition. So that kind of tension is always going to exist. Yeah, I disagree. I think we need more L3s. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay, I want to cover two final topics quick. Uh, Fire Dancer and token extensions. Um, so obviously everybody knows Fire Dancer. But, uh, you know, based on my conversations that I've had, people are pretty... Um, there's such wildly volatile expectations. Like somebody thinks it's going to be a million TPS. Somebody thinks it's going to be outages. Um, I bet you, I bet you could take 39 fire dancer systems that are optimized to the hilt and get them to do a million TPS. User like TPS. Yeah. Like, but these, this would be like a very specific deployment. Like you put them all in like the same Terra switch or like maybe even just you, you find the bare metal data centers that are like have the best network connectivity and like you, you have like peak, peak. Peak optimized systems. If you have like 40 of them, I bet you it can handle it. Wait, so why wouldn't somebody <laughs> um, just come from Silicon Valley, take the code, run a fork and raise like do $2 billion? <laughs> I don't think, well, the problem is, is that like the cost to do that by forking the code means that you don't have a competitive advantage. And like you're creating supply where there isn't demand and you're sacrificing decentralization, like net, like 
you know, the neutral base layer, all that stuff that Ethereum folks care about. We also care about that. <laughs> and you now created your own thing. And then you have to go get all these other systems to connect to it. And all they have access to is AWS. And as soon as they connect, they're like, can't do a million TPS. <laughs> right? Like a, a bunch of stuff like ends up being a job. And all of a sudden you're like, why did I ever do this? <laughs> so what is... um. Okay, what are you expecting to come out of Fire Dancer for the first release? Um, a, a working implementation that is compatible with what's running on mainnet. So we can then start pushing for 50 50 split of stake running Fire Dancer and labs. And this would mean that there could potentially be an outage when they disagree. But this would be an important outage because it shows that we care about safety over liveness and we'll fix those bugs and then we'll never have those outages again unless there's a catastrophic bug and we'll all be thankful when that when that 50-50 split halts the network <laughs> and catches that cat catastrophic bug. And that would be like, I think, really, really important. Uh, but if Fire Dancer is running on like their latest demo, like the code that they published for like processing the ledger, they ran it in like an eight cores, I think in like 16 gigs of RAM. So the hardware requirements for the current uh, load that you see on Solana are actually could be much, much lower. Um, what that tells me is not that we should lower the hardware requirements, is that we should figure out if there's bugs in the labs client that we haven't fixed yet, performance bugs, and double the capacity of the network. Like let's just start increasing block space aggressively. Let's host more hotspots, let's just like grow the network um, within, you know, if this is free, right? Like uh, if we can quadruple the, the compute units per block right now and the network is fine, it's free low, it's like free growth. Like why wouldn't we do it? <laughs> and if Fire Dancer has shown that you can get twice as much than that on 32 cores, then Labs can. Labs fixes those bugs, we double it again. Right, like we should just kind of use Fire Dancer as the horizon, like what what Labs needs to do to fix to to get to that point. Um, and it's much much easier once you see what what they fix, what analysis they've done, they've identified which specific bottlenecks that they were able to uh, to unblock. Um, and that's kind of already happening, right? Like one seventeen compute, uh, like if like the. The CPU utilization is like, I think, one fourth of what it was for 116. So, like, I don't know if we'll see, right? But, like, I, I think it would be awesome if we can basically like start increasing block space in the network, even given the current hardware deployment. We don't need a million TPS, but we need to keep doubling it every two years. Like, I think that that's really important that the network is constantly growing capacity. And it probably makes much more sense to increase that space once there's economic incentives, um, stopping bots from filling it up and just yep. eating all the empty. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Let's yeah. completely shift. But that's okay. like, that's kind of like the, the fun challenge right now is if like, we see that if we like increase like the throughput of Gulfstream, to 200,000 packets per second, it doesn't change anything because the spam is just filling up. <laughs> so you have to, you have to like, you have to do the work and figure out how to isolate the negative like externalities of like spamming hotspots to where you can then increase capacity and actually does create abundance of of like capacity. So then more hotspots could could accumulate. And Tolia, over everything we talked about today, what is your priority just from like one, two, and three? Um, probably like, funny enough, it's writing docs, which then become articles <laughs> that I publish and getting alignment. Like, I feel like I'm uh, finally like a L8 engineer back, back to my senior staff position, except instead of a big company where I have to go like talk to a bunch of teams, it's random teams in the ecosystem that like, hate the design idea or don't understand it. And then I got to like, no, look, so it actually does solve your problem. And like, make sure like Labs, Gito, uh, Mango, Fire Dancer guys are all aligned on, on getting stuff out the door. Yep. So got to write more. Yeah. Well, it, it's like, 
it's funny, like, uh, the main difference doing this in open source versus like a big company, like this process happens in every big code base. What's really nice in open source is that it happens mostly in GitHub and there's no meetings. Like you post a, a doc, people comment on it, they shit on it, you like kind of fight it over. And uh, like the, all the discussions happen in the open and it doesn't, it's not like a, ma a massive meeting schedule that you have to deal with. Okay, final question. Um, completely different, really, um, uh, in terms of what we've talked about. But I want to talk about token extensions. So formally called Token22, that's obviously something that, um, let's say, Solana Foundation is really focused on. Um, and a lot of other teams, Jupiter actually released a new NFT standard today with Bridge Split. Um, and uh, there's a lot of, of things that opens up, like confidential transfers, new metadata, uh, different programmability. Um, what do you uh, what do you think about token extensions? Why should people care about them in terms of developers, but also businesses? I think um, a weird side effect of how Solana runtime works is that instead of like defining interfaces and then a bunch of implementations, you kind of people coalesce around an implementation that kind of defines a set of protocols and business practices. What's really nice about that is that you have a single well-known implementation that everyone has verified and has gotten stress tested and gets like robust behaviors that you can plug into a whole bunch of other, other things that you can build on top. Um, and there's a negative side to that. It means that it's hard for a newcomer to go build token 2024, right? <laughs> or their own version of a token where if you're in Ethereum, you can just do that and be ERC-20 compatible. Um, but the, the ugly side of interfaces is that interfaces are leaky. They're never perfect abstractions. And in those leaky environments, the implementations will introduce attack vectors. And this is why it's very, very hard for DeFi protocols to arbitrarily add every random ERC-20 interface implementation. They have to be very, very careful about how pools and all this other stuff are designed. So... Um, and very specific about which things they enable. So you have to be on your guard always about like what works. But in Solana, like once you build like a DeFi implementation that works on top of Token 22, you can just like let all of them be instantiated because they're all, e it's the same implementation. You have guarantees about what happens when you do a transfer. Like it's not going to like yoink state from some random place or do the transfer in reverse or whatever, <laughs> whatever you can do, right? <laughs> um, this is like, it's worked well for SBL tokens and compression and NFTs. Like we've basically like been able to roll one implementation out that gets scaled really quickly a whole, across a whole bunch of applications that are user facing. And there's minimum kind of like risk and wallets have minimum kind of minimum risks. So we'll see if that happens with token 22. It's trying to kind of tackle a bigger range of problems uh, involving like for merchants, if you want to hide how much payment flow you're getting through uh, a, through your sales on, you know, through crypto, you can actually encrypt all, all those payments, stuff like this. Um, and it does it in a single standard way. So you can just go enable them and you have tools and everything else. You don't have to write any smart contracts to do this. You don't have to redeploy your own version of a token. Um, so we'll see like, what people do with this. Some of the cool things are like token 22s can be, or token extensions that can be fully compressed. So the mints can be cleaned up. So now we should be able to leverage compression for tokens. And all we're waiting for is, I think, RPC providers to support <laughs> this. <laughs> I've got two okay. of my own selfish questions before we okay. finish up. These will be quick. Um, one, and I'll tell you, I think you saw you retweeted it. I'm joining the squads team soon. Uh, I'm just curious. You've tweeted out a few ideas. What would you like to see out of out of squads? What's a feature you'd like to see? Um, what I would love to see is uh, a how to uh, set up squads with like two or three multi sig using three different hardware vendors, and then for those hardware vendors to just support squads natively. Like, what would it take to have Ledger, Keystone, and Trezor to support? squad signing in that context like because to me that's the perfect cold storage setup you have triple redundancy across 
hardware implementations, like if there's a bug, God forbid, in Ledger or something, it doesn't, it's not going to break your or, or steal your multisig because you're dependent on two or three of those succeeding. Um, so that would be awesome. I think like that should be the, the cold storage setup for everyone is like two or three multisig, three different hardware vendors, formally verified code. It's like, it's perfect. <laughs> uh, okay. Other, other stuff I think is like the Fuse wallet I think is awesome and I'd love to see like whatever we can do to to get it supported across the ecosystem so we have a kind of abstracted wallet that users can use because I think there's a lot of security benefits to to that approach. Definitely. Yeah, I haven't used it yet, but I used Argent back in the day on Ethereum, which I thought was really cool because for the first time you had social uh, recovery as well, which was just awesome compared to having a seed phrase, like blew my mind at the time. Problem is on Ethereum, the transactions are so expensive that I never wanted to use account abstraction, right? Because they even added to the fees, but that's not the case in Solana. All right, final question. Uh, Solana is known for everyone in it and the ecosystem being jacked. You've focused on your fitness over last year. You've become swolly. What is, what is just like something you've learned over last year? What's your takeaway? What's uh, like, I've always been focused on my fitness until I started Solana. I was an Ironman before this. Like, um, yeah, I, I wasn't fast. So I was doing Ironman so I could play underwater hockey. <laughs> that was that was like my, my thing. I, I was pretty obsessed with that sport. So... After starting Solana, I like basically stopped running and had kids. And then I started running again and my knees started getting swollen. And I was like, okay, so running is not for me anymore, which sucks because that was my kind of go-to stress reliever. Um, and I started getting horrible back pain. And whatever my instinct was that I think my muscles are just like getting like they were fit because I was an Iron Man. So it's not like I like totally became feeble, but like they were out of balance because I think some of the things that were strong from doing all the cardio were still pretty strong, but all the sitting and not working out, like I think had impact on all the other side supporting muscles. So my instinct was go lift weights and like basically started doing that and uh, back pain went away. So I've been doing it, I think for two years almost now. It's great. Because now my stress relief is instead of going running, I try to lift a heavy object off the ground. <laughs> yeah, that lets you and Mer need a competition. It's much harder, like for it's it's a very like uh, focusing activity because you kind of really it's not so much about raw strength. A lot of it is form, and that means a lot of fo mental focus has to be totally focused on what you're doing, and that's a lot of meditation. It's just being kind of forcing your mind to like only focus intentionally on the thing that you want to focus on. So having that exercise and like, okay, I'm going to do this big lift. If I have to get it perfect, like I can't like, <laughs> I can't like my mind can't wander and start thinking about, a, you know, like localized fee markets or whatever. <laughs> I have to like force myself to think about a thing. Having that muscle to be able to force yourself to think about something is what you need to be a good startup founder. You need to be able to like, I need to think about this problem right now. It's an important problem to solve. I can't like go do what I want to do. I have to like actually like be intentional. So I'm, I'm getting that out of it. So it's pretty good. Okay. Um, other than practicing perfect Della form, what is the one piece of advice <laughs> you'd give to Solana startup founders um, for the year? Um, Paul Graham's essays are really good. And P Peter Thiel's books are pretty good. I would, it's just all about focus, like having vision and focus and surviving long enough until like the market kind of reflects that. Um, and obviously luck that it reflects it at all. Right? You could be wrong uh, about your assumptions or something like that. But generally smart people that get like really passionate about something have thought it through long enough to where the idea is probably right. Timing could be wrong. And then you, you have to kind of keep at it and, and survive long enough to where the timing is right. Like I would say, yeah, if you want to talk to me about like startup advice, how to hire and things like that, how to scale, uh, I've got like a lot of lessons learned from that that I'm happy to share with anyone. You've, you've seen me post about them on, on Twitter too. Amazing.
Well, yeah, totally. Thanks for coming back on. Uh, Solana is super lucky to have you. I mean, you're the only sure. reason we're here in the first place. But uh, <laughs> you know, it's been it's been six months since you've come on, and uh, a lot has changed. So I'm excited <laughs> to see in the next six months, you know, where Solana's at. But uh, thanks again. It's been a lot of fun. For sure. All right. We'll sure. see you next time. All right. I've got a little ending note here. First, thank you so much for listening to the full episode. If you really liked it, hit subscribe. But secondly, make sure you sign up for DAS. This is Blockworks' biggest institutional conference happening in London in March. I've included a link in the show notes and also a discount code. You get 10% off. Make sure to use Lightspeed10 when you sign up. All right. I'll see you there. And I'll see you next time on Lightspeed. <laughs>